Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Mitchell, and Tony and I are going to talk a little bit about cross-examination this afternoon. I guess the first thing to say about cross-examination is there are some very few lawyers, and frankly, I had a partner named Jimmy LaRosa who was one of them, who God just decides to make great cross-examiners. They have an intuitive skill that most of us mortals don't have. But putting that aside, you can be an enormously effective cross-examiner, and probably the single most important aspect of that is the amount of time that you put in to preparing for the cross. I guess it was Thomas Edison who said that genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, and that's really what cross-examination is all about. Tony and I recently tried a case up in the district court in Rhode Island, and we put hundreds and hundreds of hours into various, various aspects of preparing for the cross-examination in a trial that lasted a week and a half. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk essentially about the structure of of preparation for cross-examination, and then Tony is going to give you more of the dynamics of the cross-examination itself. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about in terms of preparation is the utilization of subpoenas. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk both about federal law and about state law, um, because I know some of you practice in the federal courts and some of you practice in the state courts, so I'll try to um, give references um, to both state and federal law on these issues. And the first thing I want to talk about is the use of subpoenas to gather information in a pretrial setting. Now, in federal court, you have Rule 17C of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. That's the um, rule that obtains in uh, applications for pretrial subpoenas. Under Rule 17c, um, you have to get a subpoena so ordered by the district court judge in order to get the production of documents or evidence prior to trial. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that you should do is you should be very careful to look at the local rules for the particular district court that you're practicing in. Um, because it's not unusual for local rules to affect subpoenas, for example, in Rhode Island, where Tony and I were, neither one of us is admitted there, so we were practicing pro hoc vici, but they had a specific rule of their own that, was, that augmented or supplemented the Rule 17c um, um, app rules. So one of the things that you have to do in federal court is you have to go to the judge if you want the documents pre-trial, and you have to ask him to so order the subpoena. It gets a little complicated at that point because the question becomes, for one thing, whether or not the government has standing to make a motion to quash, or whether or not you have to even serve the government with the subpoenas. What we did um, up in Rhode Island, and what we've done in a number of other cases, is there were certain subpoenas that we really didn't care that the government knew that we were serving, and indeed, some of which we wanted the government to know that we were serving. There were other subpoenas, however, that we didn't want the government to know. So we made an application um, to serve the subpoenas ex parte and to appear before the court ex parte in order to explain to the court why the subpoenas met the test, which is functionally called the Nixon test, United States versus Nixon. It's a three-part test where you have to show relevancy, admissibility, and you have to show specificity. And uh, unfortunately, these things are linear, so I, I have to keep sign of defaulting to subcategories, but it's important for you to know that it can be very difficult if a judge wants to make your life hard in federal court to get uh, 17C subpoenas issued, because the Nixon test says functionally that you have to be able to explain to the judge uh, that a particular document or, or other piece of evidence, let's say you subpoenaed the emails from uh, 
the, the jail where the person, where a potential witness is locked up, or you subpoenaed the uh, telephone records um, from some of the OP facility. Um, and when you go to the judge, if the judge wants to give you a hard time, he'll say, well, tell me, Mr. Mitchell, what, what's in this email that um, you say is going to be relevant and indeed not only relevant but admissible as evidence? Well, you've never seen the emails. I mean, you have every reason to believe that there's relevant information in that. But, so it, it can be very hard, and sometimes it's just an insurmountable obstacle. But most of the time, and I've included, uh, just because I thought it might be useful, I included a memorandum of law that I wrote um, in support of the Rule 17C application that we made up in Rhode Island. And it goes through a lot of the cases um, that you would have to deal with if you were making a, an, an application for subpoenas. It talks about the law with respect to ex parte um, subpoena applications, and it talks about relevancy. One of the issues um, that's always raised in relevancy is whether or not you're simply asking for materials that would be used for impeachment, and theoretically that's not admissible, although there is case law that suggests that under certain circumstances, um, information that's relevant to impeachment may be something that you can obtain under a 17C subpoena. Um, but the case, the memorandum is fairly recent. It cites virtually all of the recent cases. And if you need to fight a Rule 17C contest, um, it, um, you can probably use some of the information that's in there. And, and let me just say this. It's not entirely clear. I would say the better argued position is that the government does not have standing to quash a subpoena that you have issued to a third party. Um, and that's probably true both in federal law and state law. Um, there's a couple of lower court state decisions that suggest perhaps the government has standing, but I think the better reasoned and better supported position is that the government doesn't have standing. At the same time, judges have a a, um, a responsibility under their supervisory and advisory powers to make sure that any process that is issued under the aegis of their court is appropriate. And so judges can take it on their own, um, regardless of whether or not the government can make a motion to quash to say, well, I'm, not going to, I'm either going to permit this subpoena or I'm not going to permit this subpoena for the following reasons. And when you have to get them so ordered, in federal court, which is different from state court, in state court under the CPL, and I, I won't cite the sections, but they're in the, 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 the papers that we um, submitted um, in support of our little presentations. In state court, you don't have to get the permission of the, of the trial judge to issue subpoenas or to have the documents produced prior to trial. In federal court, you do. Um, and, and at the time that you make that presentation and you offer the subpoenas, that's when you sometimes run into problems with the judge if the judge is inclined not to you know, be fairly liberal and let you, you know, use the subpoena power. So those are subpoenas, but if they're enormously helpful. Um, and you really should sit down and you should give serious thought to the kinds of documents that you want. And you should also, that should be an informed thinking, if you will, because you need to think of it in terms of, I'd love to have this, but l I'm not going to go and ask for things that I know are so clearly impeachment evidence that I'm not going to get them under a Rule 17 subpoena, and I don't want to lose the judge in one of the first outings that I have with him, and so you have to be reasonable in the scope. And another thing that, another point that is, is critical is that you have to really know the judge. I mean, as I pointed out a moment ago, Tony and I went up to try this case. I've never practiced in the district court in Rhode Island before. Uh, Tony has I, on several occasions, but this was a brand new judge. So we did everything in our power to try and find out what this judge was like. We spoke to people who were local criminal lawyers and who practiced in the federal courts. We had local counsel, of course, and one of the reasons that we chose the counsel that we did choose was their experience in this court and their experience with these various judges. Because if you, if you need to tailor what you do to your reasonable expectations about what this judge is going to allow. We've all been in front of judges in the Southern District, some of which are decent guys and will you know, give you a fair trial, and other guys 
who I'm assuming somewhat uh, dedicated to seeing the government succeed. Um, and those guys can give you a really hard time. So you really need to know the judges. You can Google the judge. You can, there's a lot of information available about judges. There are even crazy blogs out there where they rate judges and lawyers come and write in comments and stuff. But you need to know who you're in front of. You need to know whether the guy's fairly intellectual or not intellectual. And you need to know how to appeal to him. And you can also set that up in pretrial hearings. You get a chance to get a feel for the judge, see how, what he likes, see what makes him happy and what doesn't make him happy. So um, it's very important to know the judge because you're really going to tailor the way you approach the court on the basis of what you think that the judge is going to give you or not give you. Okay, well, obviously, um, you know, both under the federal constitution and under the New York State Constitution, Article 1, Section 6 of the New York State Constitution, you have a constitutional right to um, compulsory process. So that's the basis for issuing the subpoenas. Um, the other thing that's interesting that probably a lot of people don't know too much about is there's a law in New York called the Civil Rights Law. And the first few sections of the Civil Rights Law is fundamentally a Bill of Rights. And there is a, law, a statute which guarantees your right to compulsory process in addition to the constitutional provision. So you have those bases. In terms of the service, the, the geographical you know, boundaries of service, in, in federal court you can serve anywhere in the United States. State court's a little more complicated. You just need to consult the CPL. It depends to some extent on the court that's issuing the process. And depending on how high that court is, um, it, 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 the geographical um, lo uh, uh, boundaries are enlarged. But it's something you just need to be aware of. As I said, um, in terms of the government's right to, to, to make a motion to quash, and, and then we point out correspondingly, you, you know, I'm not sure that everyone realizes, but once the investigative phase of a case has ceased and the prosecutorial phase of the case has commenced, normally with the issuance of an accusatory instrument, the government is no longer allowed, theoretically, to use the grand jury, and therefore they're not allowed to issue grand jury subpoenas in order to acquire information or evidence. So theoretically, at that point, you stand equal before the bar, and if the government wants to subpoena something pretrial, they too must go to Rule 17C, just as you do, and the same rules under United States versus Nixon and its prodigy would apply. So the question then becomes, well, if you know the government has subpoenaed some third party, do you have a right to make a motion to quash? And the answer is probably no at least in federal court. In state court, it's not so clear. And there are some sort of, I won't call them ingenious, but creative ways that you can somehow overcome your inability to have standing to make a motion to quash. And that is, the CPL provides that in the absence of a rule to the contrary, the CPLR, the Civil Practice Law and Rules apply. And it specifically says in Section 60, which is the, the very small evidence section in the CPL, that in the first section, 60 something, 60.10 or something, it says that to the extent that there isn't a rule in the CPL, then the rules of the CPLR will apply. That's why um, the, the, the judge was talking about um, business records rule under the CPLR and so forth because, as I say, the civil evidentiary rules, to the extent that there are that, some, um, I, I mean, it, it's inexplicable to me why New York has never been able to pass a, a, an evidence code, but every time it gets presented in Albany, it gets shot down. Um, so we don't have a rules of evidence. I mean, as you know, most of the evidence is common law in New York. There are some rules in the CPL, there are some in the CPLR, but nothing like the federal rules of evidence. Um, but in any event, um, so in, in instances where you don't have a procedure under the CPL, you might have a procedure under the CPLR, and we're back a long ways around to say that if you don't have standing to make a motion to quash, you might have standing to prosecute um, an application to intervene under the CPLR. I think it's 
maybe section 1210. It should be in my in my uh, the the the, uh, the materials that we prepared. But um, uh, that is kind of a unique. In, in fact, one of the reasons I was thinking about it was because um, th this judge wrote this case, People versus Harris, and it was a question of whether or not the government could obtain uh, the Twitter account of of, of a putative defendant and. Um, he ruled that they that the defendant himself since the, since the subpoena was issued to twitter that the defendant himself didn't have standing to make a motion to quash but he can he considered on a motion to intervene um the same issues that he would have considered on a motion to quash so sometimes there's more than one way to skin a cat okay now i'm going to jump to uh to what in federal court we would call rule 3500 material um, and in state court, you would call it Rosario material. The first thing you want to do, of course, is you want to fight as hard as you can or cajole the prosecutor or do whatever it is that's possible to get 3,500 material or Rosario material as soon before trial as you can because that is really going to be very critical material. That's the material that you're going to digest completely. Those, that's the material that you're probably going to utilize in order to confront the witnesses. That's where you're going to find the inconsistent statements. So typically 3,500 material would be police reports, FBI 302 reports, it would be grand jury testimony, and it would be witness interviews. Now, once again, the, there can, if you have a, a hard judge, a tough judge in federal court, you can have a long day arguing about whether or not you've gotten all the 3,500 material that you're entitled to. And if you look at section 3,500 in Title 18, they're also called Jenks Act because the, the, the statute was promulgated after the decision in the United States versus Jenks by the Supreme Court. Um, but if you look at the statute, it, it functionally says that 3500 material has to be a, either a verbatim statement by the person whose material, who the material relates to, or that it has to be um, something that was recorded functionally in real time verbatim. Now, typically, that's not enforced. You get the FBI 302 reports, which are interview reports. You get the grand jury testimony. You get, if prosecutors interview witnesses and are dumb enough to take notes, you get those. Um, but um, if a judge want, or, or if the government wants to play hardball with you, um, they, 3,500 material can be pretty stingy. Now, the thing that I was surprised to learn when I was looking at some cases and preparing these materials was state court is very liberal in terms of what is Rosario material. In fact, I saw one case, and, and it's in the materials that I submitted, one case in which um, a prosecutor had met with a witness that was going to be a witness for the prosecution. The wit he took no contemporaneous notes. The witness left. He then took, wrote up what he was going to ask the witness and, of course, incorporated in his preparation notes statements that the witness had made. They ruled that that was Rosario material. I mean, that's a very liberal view. And they've ruled in other instances that, that um, worksheets that were created from discussions with, um, with putative witnesses also constituted Rosario material. So, one of the things that I, that I really want to stress is you've got to fight for all of this. And another thing is, if you don't preserve these issues, you go up on appeal and they'll say, I'm sorry, it uh, wasn't preserved below, you're facing you know, a plain error review and good luck. So, I mean, it's real, you're, you, you really have a responsibility as a lawyer to insist upon, to make motions um, demanding Rosario material, raising cases like this and saying, Judge, you know, you may not have considered it, may, maybe the government didn't consider it, but if there are notes that this man made, even if they weren't contemporaneous, we're entitled to the, anything that contains statements of the witnesses. So you want to fight to get it as early as you can, um, and you know, under the law, you're not entitled to it very early. Under 3500, you're not entitled to it until the witness leaves the witness stand after his direct testimony. Um, but normally, a judge will tell the government, look, you know, give it to them a week in advance or three days in advance. Um, and that's really the critical information. The other thing that you want to argue is that it's not 3500 material, it's Brady material. Because you're entitled to Brady material normally earlier, although there's some bad case law in the Second Circuit. Um, 
but if you argue that it's Brady material and that you need an opportunity to be able to see it and to, and to perhaps conduct an investigation and so forth, then maybe you'll get what otherwise would be given to you at the last minute as 3500 material or Rosario material. You'll get it as Brady material and you'll get it earlier. And as we said before, like someone asked a question about, um, uh, you know, how can you uh, show that uh, a government witness is being rewarded for his testimony because he got a commendation letter. I mean, oftentimes, those, the kinds of, you need a, like a Brady checklist, and I mean, you need to develop a, a really good Brady demand. I mean, I have one that I've worked on for 30 years, and um, there isn't anything in the, under the sun that I don't ask for. And, and even though it seems a little tedious, maybe, the fact is no one's ever going to go on appeal and say, oh, he never asked for that. Uh, this is plain error, you know, they had it, but he didn't ask for it. I trust me, it, I asked for it. Um, and I'm serious. The other thing is, um, and I, I'm sure everyone's aware of it, but I'll just think it's worth mentioning. You get 3,500 material or Rosarian material not just at trial, but you get it for hearings. So if you have a motion to suppress or you have a Huntley hearing or a Wade hearing or a hearing like that, under the federal rules, I think it's 26.2, it sets out the various hearings that you're entitled to get 3,500 material. So if you get 3,500 material and you have a suppression hearing and maybe one of the witnesses who's going to be a critical witness at the trial is going to testify, make your application to get the 3500 of the Rosario material so you'll have it way before the trial. And be aware that you're entitled to it for those hearings. Okay, now I'm going to talk just briefly about private investigators. It's been my experience that it's very hard to find good private investigators. Um, but if you do find one, and you're going to send them out to, invest, to investigate, and, and, and principally you're going to have them go out, hopefully, and interview witnesses, you have to give some thought to that. First of all, you have to make sure that you spend enough time with the fellow or with the woman so that they know the case. Because you're not going to be there, and you're not going to be there for a very good reason, and that reason is that you don't want to make yourself a witness. So if you're going to send a, uh, an investigator out to speak to witnesses, he needs to know enough about the case so that he can spontaneously ask the next logical question. There's nothing more exasperating that when the guy comes back and he says, oh, well, she told me, he told me this, and you say, well, did you ask him that? No. Oh, why didn't you ask him that? I mean, it's just logical, it's apparent, but some of these guys are lazy, they don't want to spend the time, they don't want to invest the time to, to really know the facts of the case, and so you've got to make sure that you know, that you, that you sit the guy down, and if you have to force feed him, so be it. And at the same time, you want to debrief them as, as quickly as possible afterwards so that if there's things that need to be followed up, you can send them out to do it right away. Now, there's another consideration that you need, a tactical consideration that you need to make when you're um, dealing with uh, interviewing witnesses or having your investigator interview witnesses. And that is, do I want to memorialize the witness's statement? Now, there's two ways to do it. In New York, we're a consent state, which means to say that if one person consents to the recording of a conversation, that's good, even though the other person doesn't know that you're recording him. So if somebody was recording, well, if you, if you had lunch with someone and they had a wire on, that would be perfectly legal. They don't need a court order. They don't, it's not a wiretap. There are 11 or 12 states that don't, pres don't permit single person consent, and I, I, I put them down. Tony State, Massachusetts doesn't permit it. Um, Florida doesn't permit it. Um, but so you, you can send a, uh, an investigator out with a wire on, and sometimes that can be enormously effective because if the investigator is good and the guy doesn't realize he's on a wire, you might get some really extraordinary stuff. Or the investigator alternatively can take notes. But here's the problem. The problem is that the minute that you memorialize the statement, you've now created reverse 3500 material or reverse Rosario material. So if that witness takes the stand, you're going to be obligated to turn over that statement to the government. And so since, you, since in most instances you don't know what's coming out of this man's or this woman's mouth, 
you got to use real caution in deciding whether or not you want to memorialize a statement from a witness. Another thing that <coughs> I don't think lawyers do enough of is make motions in limine. What, what Tony and I did in this case up in Rhode Island was we made a whole series of motions in limine. Um, and they were, they were designed to try to shape the case into the, into the form that we wanted. And in addition to that, we wanted to cut off any surprises. We wanted to cut off any ambushes. So we wanted to know what we could admit. And we would make a motion in limine asking the court functionally for an advisory opinion. Can, will, you know, it, will, will you admit this evidence? or to prevent the government make a motion saying the government shouldn't be permitted to offer this evidence for the following reasons and to cut them off so that you knew you didn't have to deal with that problem or that wasn't a danger or you weren't vulnerable on that issue. Um, motions in limine are very effective and I know it takes time and there's just a finite amount of time and you know that we have but if you're in, in an important case, it's really worth the effort to make the motions. And at the same time, you know, if you do a really nice set of motions or if you, if you are making motions in limine and you're there supported by good arguments and sound research, you begin to win the judge over. I mean, you get to a point in a case where the judge says, this guy's pretty smart. Um, and if you can get that to that point, you get two good things. First of all, you get the judge saying, yeah, I like this guy, he's smart, he spends the time, he knows the law. And the other thing you get is the reverse. This guy knows what he's doing. And I'm not going to make crazy rulings against this guy because if I do, he's going to take me up on them and I'm going to look stupid. And he's going to make a record and I know that. And so you establish the kind of rapport that you want with a judge. And so putting in the effort to do good motions or motions in limine is really worth the effort. The next thing is, and this is sort of along the same lines, is I like to make very comprehensive requests to charge and to submit those even before the trial commences. Um, and the reason for doing that is you need to know what the judge is going to tell. I mean, forget all the typical stuff about, you know, uh, burden of proof and uh, presumption of innocence. I mean, normally in a case, there's one or two critical instructions that you want. We had in our case, we were trying a bribery case and we were arguing that it was extortion, not bribery. And that's a pretty difficult road to hoe, particularly in federal court. But we had one First Circuit case that we relied on and we pounded away on it, and the government really didn't have an answer to it. Um, and we made our, we made our, our um, request to charge before the trial started because we wanted to make sure that this judge was going to give us the charge that we needed so that we could argue to the jury that this was extortion and not, um, and not um, bribery, and we didn't want him to get up and charge the, judge, charge the jury later on. You know, extortion is not a defense to bribery, and then we're out the door. So it, oftentimes, you want to put together your request to charge and submit them and, and ask for a conference with the court on them before you even start the trial, before you open, before you voir dire, because you want to know that you have that defense available, and that's critical. Um, and it's going to shape your cross-examination as well. A um, couple of things. Uh, one of the anomalies between federal practice and state practice is you almost never get a case in federal court where there isn't a conspiracy charge. And so you're almost never dealing with an instance in which you don't have co-conspirator declarations to deal with. And after um, that wonderful decision in Crawford versus Washington, um, there's no Sixth Amendment uh, confrontation right with respect to co-conspirator declarations. So they can bring in declarations from the biggest mud in the world and they never have to put them on the witness stand. Um, and under federal law, you have some relief. Under Rule 806 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, you are allowed to cross-examine or present evidence um, against declarations that are submitted or admitted as a hearsay exception to, um, 
to, to uh, or an exception to the hearsay rule, you, you can bring in anything that you could have cross-examined the person with. Um, and that was very important to us because in this particular case, one of the guys had a horrible um, uh, past and was, uh, uh, you know, just the juiciest um, candidate for cross-examination and the government knew it and they weren't going to call him. They had some co-conspirator tapes that they were going to play and they were never going to put this guy before the jury. The jury's never going to see what a creep this guy was and it was a, a problem we had to deal with and so we turned to Rule 806 because 806 gave us the right to offer what we could have offered had he testified even though he didn't testify. And I, I went to look to see whether or not there was some equivalent, and as I said before, you know, the problem with New York State evidence is it's common law. So you can't go to Rule 806 because it doesn't exist, and so you have to do a big Lexis search to try and find a case that held that. Uh, ultimately, I did find a case. Um, uh, there was a decision in 1989 by uh, Leslie Crocker Snyder, actually, um, people versus tie it's cited in the materials and at that she specifically said that she thought that the principles of rule 806 would apply in a state court proceeding so if you get into a situation where you have a co-conspirator declaration to deal with and they're not going to call the guy there's other things you can do to impeach that guy and I would cite that case the other thing that you need to do is if you're going to be a good cross-examiner, you need to know the rules of evidence. You need to know, for example, that you can't offer extrinsic evidence if it goes to impeachment. And you need to know, for example, that if you ask a question and it's extrinsic and the witness denies it or makes up some lie, you're going to take that right between the eyes because you're not going to get the opportunity to offer whatever rebuttal extrinsic evidence you have because it's collateral. So you have to be careful. You can't just go ask a lot of questions that, you know, that may make you look good until the guy gives you the answer that you don't like or the answer that hurts you and you, and you say to the judge, you know, I'd like to offer this and he goes, no, no, Mr. Mitchell, that's extrinsic. We're not going to have a 40 trials within one here, I mean, if it, it, it's, you're not admitting it. And you're stuck with that answer. So you have to give thought to that. Now, there are ways to try to blunt that. And there are essentially three arguments that you make. You say, judge, it's not extrinsic. It goes to motive. Now, if it goes to show bias, motive, interest, or hostility, then it's not collateral and you can bring it in. So your argument is, no, judge, it's not, it, it's, not, it's not merely for impeachment, it shows bias or it shows motive. And they're pretty amorphous terms. And then once again, you're dealing with you know, how is the judge going to give you decent leeway or not. The other, the other arguments you can make is that extrinsic evidence is always admissible to prove a witness's reputation for truthfulness. And then the third argument that you can make, and this gets a little complicated, is that it's reverse 404B or it's reverse Molino materials. And we've all been on the wrong side of the infinite number of 404B or Molino decisions in which these proof of other crimes somehow come in under the most bizarre theories, you know, that it proves that this guy was the other guy's cousin. Or, I mean, just crazy stuff. But, but it's very hard, as you know, to win the 403, 404B argument. The government almost always succeeds. But there is all of that wonderful case law out there when you have a situation in which you're arguing for a reverse 404B application. That is to say, where you want to use extrinsic proof concerning the conduct of a government witness, let's say. In, in our case, we wanted to do that because this guy was a shakedown artist. He was a member of some local uh, zoning board, and he used to shake everybody who wanted to get a zoning permit down, and we wanted to prove that. And you've got to remember, another very forceful argument that goes along with this 404B, this reverse 404B claim, is that you have a constitutional right to present a defense. And that constitutional right to present a defense is very, very significant to the effect that there's case law that says that you can even offer inadmissible evidence 
if it's relevant and critical to presenting your defense. And so those are the kinds of arguments that you want to fashion when you're facing a claim that it's extrinsic or it's collateral. You want to say it's not. Look, it goes to motive, it goes to bias, perhaps it's a reverse 404B, or in some instances it's uh, relevant to the witness's truthfulness or reputation for it. You also should know when a prior recollection refreshed applies and, and what the, 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 uh, the elements of that are and how to put that before the court. Another thing that you see with inexperienced cross-examiners is that they open the door. Okay. Um, I'm going to speed up for and take Tony's time. Um, be careful not to open the door. I've seen a million cases where a guy gets so carried away with his cross-examination that he asks way too broad questions. The government gets up and starts examining him. You object, and the judge says, slow down, Mr. Mitchell. You open the door to that, and you can get creamed um, by doing that. So you've got to be very careful not to do that. Um, uh, uh, two, final, two final things. One is that if you have an important case and you're going to do, have an important cross, you've got to prepare for it and you've got to allot your time. You know, we're all busy, we all put things off, I'm as guilty as anybody, but you can't just keep putting things off. There comes a time where you have to sit down and get that cross prepared. And in addition to that, you'll often have exhibits, all kinds of exhibits that you might have. You have grand jury testimony. If you have tapes in the case, you've got to make your own tapes and your own excerpts and your own transcripts. And uh, perhaps you have pictures or you have some kind of... Uh, of a visual presentation that you have to make. That's all got to get organized. And even if you have a paralegal or somebody helping you, you've got to supervise it. You've got to know what it is. And maybe you need certified copies of convictions. I mean, you can, do, you can waste a lot of time doing these ministerial tasks. And it all takes away from sitting down and preparing the cross. So don't sell yourself short in terms of time. You really need to allot a sufficient amount of time to prepare the cross. And then finally, I'll just close with one thing. Make sure when you're finished your cross, when you're finished your case, that you never rest until you have gone back and checked that every exhibit that you think that you put in evidence is actually in evidence. I can't tell you how many times I've seen either prosecutors or defense lawyers rest their case, then there's a note or something from the jury and it turns out that Exhibit 12 was offered for identification, but it was never received in evidence. Make sure, get a list, go to the clerk or the stenographer, whoever keeping the records, and say, are all of these exhibits in evidence? Thank you.